many of my growing up years uh, in Maryland, where I saw firsthand what Japanese beetles can do. And, and I can tell you that I'm very happy that the Oregon Department of Agriculture has a program to stop them from becoming established here. Some of you might subscribe to the Smithsonian Magazine and last October have read that rather scary article about the spotted lanternfly. And if you can remember, just before COVID hit, what we were all afraid of then were murder hornets. So tonight's topic seems particularly apt on invasive pests. I'm pleased to have with us Dr. Jessica Rendon, who is an entomologist with the Oregon Department of Agriculture. It's a insect prevention and management program here to discuss the invasive pests that are of concern to us in Oregon. The Pacific Northwest holds a special place in Jessica's heart. After bouncing from one end to get a Bachelor of Science degree in, uh, the, uh, in uh, environmental science at Humboldt State, she then went to the other end to get a PhD in entomology at the University of Idaho, and now she's back here in the middle. She works with her fellow entomologists and colleagues to monitor, identify, and eradicate invasive insect species here in Oregon. There is a number of these in addition to the ones that uh, I've already mentioned, some of which I've never heard of, that uh, Jessica will tell us about tonight. She'll discuss why they're a threat, how to identify them and some of their lookalikes, and what can be done to stop their spread. So Jessica, welcome. We're very happy to have you with us tonight. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. All right, so should I take it away? Okay. All right. So yeah, thanks everybody for having me. I, it's great to be here with you all. Um, tonight I'll be going over, I think, nine different um, pests that either we're trying to keep out of Oregon, a few that we do have in Oregon, and some that are looming on the horizon. Um, so yeah, I'll jump into it. Uh, I think during two uh, halfway and midway points from in the presentation, I'll stop and take questions. And then at the very end, I'll go over some ways you can help um, look for these pests and what you can do to help keep them out of Oregon. Um, so yeah. Uh, for first, just very briefly, uh, yeah, I am part of the Insect Pest Prevention and Management Division of the Oregon Department of Agriculture. And our goal is to protect Oregon's agriculture, natural resources, and its residents from damaging insect pests. And we do this through early detection and rapid response. So every year we are monitoring and placing out several thousand different traps for various um, pests that we do not want in Oregon. Um, we put them throughout the entire state. And if we do find something, we often then have to do an eradication program to hopefully eradicate that pest if it's found. Um, so that's mainly what I do at ODA is look for pests and if we find them, try to get rid of them. The main one that I, I've been working with, at least at ODA, is the Japanese beetle. This is a, a highly, highly invasive insect. Um, as the name implies, it's native to Japan. It was first introduced in 1916 in New Jersey through, um, I believe, iris uh, bulbs from Japan. And since then, it has infested and partially infested roughly 37 um, different states back east and in the Midwest. And the Japanese beetle is not picky about what it eats. Um, it happily devours over 300 different plant species, um, our agricultural crops, ornamental plants, turf grass, many of our native species, um, the beetle will happily eat. So it's not picky at all. And it's damaging in two different ways. So the larvae feed on the roots of plants in the soil. So this picture is of a golf course and all of that yellowing and dying back of the grass is because the larvae are in the soil eating away at the roots and they've pulled back some of that turf and it's just you know, completely covered in larvae, Japanese beetle larvae eating the roots. And the adults also heavily damage plants. They feed on the foliage, um, flowers, and fruits of plants. 
and they do what's called skeletonizing the leaf. So they will eat all the nice soft bits of the leaf, leaving behind the veins of the leaf. So it kind of looks like a skeleton, a skeletonized version of a leaf. Um, and yeah, they're very prolific and they will completely devour all the leaves. Um, that's what this picture kind of shows. This is a linden tree also on that golf course. Um, in the back, you can kind of see the trees are nice and green and those trees in the, the foreground are, it looks like it's fall for them, but actually this is the peak of summer. So they should all have nice green leaves, but the Japanese beetle is coming through completely devouring all the leaves from the tree. And as you can imagine, that's not gonna be healthy for the tree. If this keeps up year after year, the tree will eventually die because it's not able to photosynthesize. And also Japanese beetle, one of its um, most preferred host plants is roses. They will completely devour the leaves, the roots and the flower itself of, of roses. Um, Portland, one of its nicknames is the City of Roses, and we have a wonderful rose garden. Um, so yeah, we definitely do not want Japanese beetle established in Oregon because it will be very devastating to everybody's roses and our rose garden. So how can you identify the Japanese beetle? Um, the adult is fairly easy to identify. Um, it has to have all three of uh, these characteristics. So one, a green metallic head and thorax, two, reddish brown wing coverings, and three, five patches of white hair along the side of its abdomen, and two white patches of hair on its uh, tip of its abdomen. So if you find a beetle that has all three of those characteristics, it's almost certainly a Japanese beetle, and you should let us know about it. Um, yeah, and the larva, you can also identify Japanese beetle based on their larval stage, but it's a lot, it's, it's pretty tricky. You've, yeah, so trickier to do. Um, they are a scarab beetle. So in the family, uh, scarab, it's a scarab, I might be able to pronounce it correctly, but they're in the scarab family. So they have a C shape to them. And how you can identify them, the Japanese beetle, is if you look under a microscope at the tip of their abdomen on their raster. Um, so that's the tip of their abdomen. If you look at the hair patterns, they have different hair um, patterns at the tip of their abdomen that tells you what species it is. Um, and we do have many na native scarab species here in Oregon. So this is kind of a trickier thing to do to um, identify the larva but the adults are much more easy to identify. Oh, and here are just some uh, lookalikes. So every year we get phone calls or emails from people asking, you know, is this the Japanese beetle, which is great. <laughs> and most of the time it ends up being one of these lookalikes. Um, golden blue crested beetles, ground beetles, marmorated stink bugs, box elder bugs, um, all of these things have a can generally kind of have some look to the Japanese beetle in coloring or shape, but none of them have, you know, all three of those characteristics together. Um, the one I think that is the most look alike to the Japanese beetle is called the little bear scarab beetle. So it has two out of the three characteristics, the green head and thorax, brown wing coverings, but instead of having five patches of white hair, it's kind of all covered in white hair. So yeah, different. That's the third thing that's different that you can tell it's not the Japanese beetle. Um, but if you're ever in doubt, you know, feel free to shoot us an email and we'll take a look. Okay, now gypsy moth. So gypsy moth is another um, invasive insect that we do not want in Oregon. Um, currently, the European gypsy moth, it was introduced in Massachusetts in 1869, and it's currently established in 19 different um, states back east. It's highly devastating back there. They defoliate millions of um, hardwood trees every year. 
um, oak, apple, alder, hazelnut, um, plum, cotton, willow birch, all of these the moth larva will devour. And that's the European gypsy moth, which is established um, back east. There's a, another subspecies of gypsy moth, the Asian gypsy moth, which we currently do not have um, in, the United, in the United States. And we, we hope to keep it that way. Um, they're very similar to European gypsy moth, but uh, another negative thing about them is they also, they feed on hardwoods as well, but they also feed on conifer trees. So pines, firs, hemlocks, they'll happily devour those as well. So they have a wider diet breadth. And yeah, they can be much more devastating because of that. The damage they cause because they can just completely defoliate millions of acres of trees, it's obviously very damaging to the natural ecosystem. Um, if you happen to be walking in one of these uh, forested areas, people talk about it sounding like rain is falling but it's, it's not rain, it's the caterpillar poop that's falling down all over you. That's kind of what the one picture um, of the pavement is showing. All those little brown specks are actually the caterpillar frass, it, the caterpillar poop. Um, so yeah, it's probably not very pleasant to be hiking just and being rained on with caterpillar poop. Um, the larva of gypsy moth also can be harmful to people because they're covered in these uh, long hairs. And when they shed their, their exoskeleton, all the hairs also fall down on people. And it can be highly irritating to many people's skin because they're you know, irritating, really small irritating hairs and people can get rashes and if you breathe it in, breathe it in, it's not very good for you either. So yeah, we, it's not, not fun. So how can you identify a gypsy moth? I hope you don't see them, but you know, you can, you can try, uh, look, look for them. The larvae are fairly distinctive. They have long hairs, as I mentioned, and they have five pairs of blue spots and followed by six pairs of red spots along its body. So five blue, six red spots, and then the Adult males are also somewhat easy. Well, they can be easy to identify, but we do have many lookalikes. So that's what makes it kind of tricky. But um, what might cue you in into maybe you might have a, a gypsy moth male. Um, if you look at its wing, its front wing, it has these kind of dark M squiggly lines, um, those dark, little squiggly lines are one of one characteristic. Also plumose antenna. So the arrow is kind of pointing to the big picture where you can see the really um, feathered antenna. So the males, they use their antenna to smell where the females are. So they want a lot of surface area to be able to capture those, uh, the scent of the female that's in the air. So those two things, if you see those two things together on a moth, maybe it could be the gypsy moth. There are a lot of lookalikes though. Um, and there, unfortunately there's too many <laughs> to go over, but just to give you an idea of what we look for when we're looking at a potential moth. Oh, uh, so lookalikes. Uh, the two lookalikes that we get reports of most often for uh, gypsy moth are fall webworm and tent caterpillar. Uh, so those first two pictures are pictures of the, the larva. And you can see while they do have, you know, hair, long hairs like the gypsy moth, they don't have those, um, the blue and red spots in this, the same, you know, so they don't have the same coloring as gypsy moth. But oftentimes people see them in trees far, kind of far away covered in these webbing. So it can be difficult to look for those, you know, colored spots, but they just see a big webbing in the tree and they're, it can be quite um, striking. And so people wonder, oh no, is this the invasive gypsy moth I've been hearing about? But luckily uh, it's not. Gypsy moths do not make webbing at all. 
Um, so if you see webbing like this in the tree, it's most likely the fall webworm or tent caterpillar. And they are native. Um, so, and they usually do not do, you know, extensive damage to our native trees. Uh, if you're, if you do have a tree that has, you know, a ton of them on them, we often recommend people just cutting off those branches if you want, um, putting it in a paper bag and throwing it away. But usually it's not really a cause of concern to have fall webworm or tent caterpillar. Okay. Asian giant hornet, and after after I talk about Asian giant hornet, then I'll take a few uh, questions before I continue because I know I've been talking a lot. Um, this is the big exciting one, um, exciting and scary, I guess. Um, Asian giant hornet, Vespa mandarinia is its common name. You might have heard it heard it been called murder hornets. It's a really ca catchy name, but. I, we like Asian giant hornet instead. <laughs> um, it's the world's largest hornet. Um, there's 22 hornet species in the world, and this one happens to be the largest. Um, they're native to Asia, Japan, Korea, and China, and they are apex predators. Um, I kind of think they look like little, little tigers, which is appropriate because they are apex predators. They'll feed on many different things, uh, medium to large size insects, beetles, katydids, mantids, caterpillars, other wasps, um, just about anything. Uh, they can get their mandibles around. It's fair game for them because they're, they're the top of the food chain. Uh, we are worried about this, this species if it gets into Oregon and Washington because it could be very, very damaging in many different ways. We're concerned about our native species because they're apex predators they and they feed on so many different things we're not sure exactly what that means for our native species here in the United States and in Oregon. Um, in Washington where they do have a um, potential population there they one of the residents did take a picture of the Asian giant hornet feeding on a paper wasp nest um, there at his home. So that is clear documentation that they are going to be attacking our native uh, insect species. Um, so it's, yeah, not going, going to be good. <laughs> and we're also very concerned about our, our honeybees. So even though honeybees aren't native to uh, North America, they're still an extremely important part of our agriculture and pollinating our crops. Um, but Asian giant hornet, it goes into what's called the slaughter phase in the fall. So throughout the you know spring and summer, they'll just eat insects here or there. But in the fall, when they're reproducing the next uh, generation of Asian giant hornets for the next year, they need a lot more a uh, lot more protein to grow those new reproductive casts. So. They love to attack honeybee colonies because honeybee colony has tens of thousands of honeybees. And so that's a huge protein source for them. So a few, a handful to a dozen Asian giant hornets will specifically target a honeybee colony and completely decapitate and kill all of the adults within a few hours or a day or so. They'll go into the colony take out all of the, the baby bees, all the larva and pupa, and bring that back to the Asian giant hornet colony and feed it to their young. So it, it, they can completely wipe out honeybee colonies here. And our Apis mellifera, the honeybee we have here, has no real defense against this. They're completely sitting ducks. And then finally, we were worried about Asian giant hornet for our, our own uh, health and safety. Um, the insect is too, you know, can be two inches long, and so it has a very large stinger. Um, the venom that it can inject in people, um, it's my understanding, it's not necessarily more toxic than, say, a honeybee or a yellow jacket sting. But the Asian giant hornet, because they can sting repeatedly and with um, a much larger amount of venom is injected into the, you know, the mammal or pe people. That's what causes a uh, health concern, just 
the huge amount of venom that can be injected into you. Um, it, this, a sting can lead to necrosis of the sting site. And if you are sensitive, you could go into anaphylaxis, which is obviously a huge health concern. Um, yeah, and even if you don't go into anaphylaxis, just the, the pain of it, um, it's been described as having like a hot, uh, like a red hot thumbtack, like, you know, pushed into your, your skin and like left there for a couple hours. So as you can imagine, that would not be pleasant. So Asian giant hornet identification, this, this is a big one because we, well, they're all important, but we definitely want people to have their, you know, eyes open and be looking for, you know, a huge <laughs> hornet flying around because we want to, if this is in Oregon or if it becomes a, a threat to Oregon, we want to know about it as soon as possible. So the first thing is its size. It's between one and a half to two inches long. So it's quite large. Uh, it has a very large orange head, um, prominent black eyes. And another uh, distinguishing characteristic is it has an orange head and the kind of a brown blackish thorax. So two very distinct coloring co colors. You can really identify the head area versus the thorax area. It's not the same color, it's very different. Um, and it also has complete um, orange and black stripes on its abdomen and a, a pinched in waist. So it kind of has that hourglass figure. Um, and some people have described it when they see it flying um, in, you know, back in Asia and in Washington, it almost looks like a, chi a children's toy because it's so large and such a bright orange head, almost like, you know, a paint, paint on a child's toy. So there, I, I guess, unfortunately for us, there are many, many different lookalikes for the Asian giant hornet. Um, based on size and coloration, a lot of things can kind of superficially um, resemble Asian giant hornet. This is a graphic um, that kind of has some of the most common lookalikes at, at the bottom in the red box is a, I think it's the queen Asian giant hornet and a worker Asia, Asian giant hornet. So that's, that's the target. Up at the top there in that black box is the great golden digger wasp. Um, we often get phone calls of people seeing this uh, and mistaking it for Asian giant hornet because it does have roughly the same colors, orange and black. But if you look at its waist, it has a really thin little, little waist, not really a, like an hourglass shape that the Asian giant hornet has. Elm sawfly is another one we get quite often because it is also very large, um, but it doesn't have that big bright orange head and the striping on its abdomen is more yellow, doesn't really have orange and black striping. But really uh, not having that big orange bright head is a clear giveaway that it's not the Asian giant hornet. Same thing for our yellow jackets. We have a few different yellow jacket species in Oregon. The queens can be quite large and make a you know very large buzzing buzzing sound. Um, but again, none of them have a bright orange head. They all have yellow and uh, heads that have yellow and black colors on them. Ah, cicada killers. So cicada killers, I think, are the most uh, lookalikes to Asian giant hornet. The coloring on their abdomen is somewhat similar. It's not quite as striped, but it, it does have a resemblance. But again, the main way you can tell it, they don't have a bright orange head and their head coloring is very similar to their thorax. So Asian giant hornet, you can definitely tell orange head, dark thorax with cicada killers their head and thorax are much more similar in color, not a very distinct um, difference. And the last lookalike is horntails or wood wasps. 
So these can be quite long. They're not quite as, uh, as thick as Asian giant hornet, but they are large and long. And they have uh, an impressive, the females anyways, have impressive um, ovipositors. So they, it's not a stinger, so they can't sting, sting you, but those ovipositors they use to lay their eggs into wood. And so they have to be you know, large and pretty sturdy to get into wood to lay their eggs. But um, people often mistake them for Asian giant hornet because they are quite striking and somewhat similarly colored. Okay, so I think maybe this would be a good point to take or stopping point to take a few questions before continuing on with more, more bad insects. So you're welcome to either pipe up out loud and, and uh, ask your question, or if you prefer, uh, you can always send your question in on the chat and I'll be monitoring the chat and I can read those out. Any questions? I guess you've overwhelmed people. Why don't you go <laughs> on ahead? Oh, wait a minute. Uh, we have a couple of just popped up. Are the murder hornets so large that they can be excluded from honeybee hives? Um, yeah, so there are excluders that people use like in Japan and in Asia. Um, but the problem is they'll, they'll often just wait outside of that excluder and then pick off the honeybees as they fly out. <laughs> Um, but that does give people a chance to maybe, once they see that there is hornets actively trying to get to their colony, that gives people a chance to trap them in some other way to hopefully then save the majority of their hive. Have any of these been seen in Benton County? Asian giant hornet? No. No, not Asian giant hornet, as far as I know. <laughs> As far as I know, it's only been found in that small part of uh, Washington, um, right at the border of Canada. No, I meant any of the invasive species that you've been mentioning. Oh, let's see. So Japanese beetle, n not at least not recently. I know in the past they we we find Japanese beetle every so often in different places in Oregon. I can't remember if it's been found before my time, but so Jap not Japanese beetle currently. Gypsy moth, I think they have found um, singletons. I don't, in the last few years, I, I believe so in Benton County. So usually when we find gypsy moth, we find one or two. So that's like a hitchhiker or something like that. And in we then set up many more, many more traps the following year to hopefully make sure that that's not a establishing population, that it was only just a, a lone hitchhiker, which is usually the case. Um, if we ever find more <laughs> a gypsy moth, then we usually have to do an eradication. Uh, we recently did an eradication in Corvallis, maybe not last year, but the year before. Um, I can't remember if Corvallis is Benton County or Lane yes. County. Oh, Maybe it is? Benton. Okay. <laughs> well, then, yep. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So definitely Gypsy Moth was in Benton County, but we think we eradicated that little population that we found. Good. I know that was a big concern of the Christmas tree industry about 20 years or so ago. So it's good it's not here. Yes. Um, and the last question, what type of nest does the murder hornet make? Yeah, so they almost always, well, they prefer to nest in the ground. So like in a tree hollow or some kind of um, underground area, they'll go in there and make their nest. They make uh, what you would think of as a, you know, a yellow jacket type nest. So a papery structure with hexagonal little cells where they put their, you know, lay their eggs and the pupa grow or larva grows. Um, but it's usually in an enclosed underground area. 
the one in Washington was inside a, a hollowed out tree. So if you see a like a, a yellow jacket type nest hanging up in a tree that is almost certainly not Asian giant hornet, they don't really nest in a, you know, a free structure in a tree. Okay, thank you. I think that's all the questions for now. All right, let's keep going with more, more of these then. <laughs> Uh, Southern pink moth. This is a really, really new one. Um, it's a really pretty one. Uh, it's a moth that's native to Mexico and the southeastern U.S. Uh, just recently, a few years ago, a few specimens were found in Southern California. The larvae feed exclusively on salvia species, so I, that's sage, I believe. Um, they, the larvae feed on fla the flowers, buds, and all the different plant tissue. And last year in 2020 in Milwaukee, Oregon in July, I, I think it was a master gardener. I can't remember if it was or not, but um, they submitted a, an, uh, a picture of this moth that they didn't recognize. I think they sent it to OSU Extension first. Uh, wish I had my facts right. But anyways, they notified someone and then they notified us of this new moth here in Oregon. Um, we're unsure of how it got here to Oregon, possibly from plant uh, nursery plants brought up from California potentially, um, bringing plants that maybe had those larvae on them and then brought them up to Oregon and you know they're <laughs> eating all those nice salvia plants and being a pest. Here's a picture of some of the damage the larva is, uh, can do on the, the salvia. They bore into and feed on the flowers, buds, and other tissues. Um, they are a salvia specialist, so they only feed on salvia, both wild and ornamental varieties. Um, they seem to really like ornamental varieties too. Culinary sage, chia, and hot lips, I think was the variety that was first noticed to have uh, the southern pink moth, moth damage here in Oregon. So if you have any of those varieties, especially hot lips, maybe keep an eye out on them this year. Um, so there's currently no guidelines at the moment because it's so new, um, but definitely keep an eye out. And if you happen to see this, let us know. The they're fairly you know, striking, both the adults and the larva. The adults are really are fairly small though, only about half an inch long. Their forewings are pink, a pink reddish, really pretty color. And you can maybe tell at the very bottom of those wings, you can see little, um, like a fringe of grayish brown hair. It's really pretty with the pink, I think. Um, there's not, no other look-alike <clears throat> look -alike here in Oregon that has those bright pink wings with little fringe at the end. The larvae are also pretty distinctive. They're pale, almost translucent. They look really jelly-like, I think, and they have all those little black dots on that translu translucent body. And Oh, I forgot to mention the when they bore into the flower buds and the plant, they leave these little like circles. Um, you can kind of see it back on this this page. All those almost perfect little circles of where it's boring into is you know just distinctive for the damage it leaves. Okay, spotted spotted lanternfly is another big one that's looming <laughs> just on the horizon. Um, it's another very pretty insect, I think, but it's a plant hopper that's native to China, India, and Vietnam. It was first detected in Pennsylvania fairly recently in 2014. It has since then um, established in many other different Eastern states. So it's spreading very, very rapidly over there. It feeds on over a hundred different plant uh, species. Its preferred host is Tree of Heaven. Tree of Heaven um, is a, an invasive tree that we have here in the United States. 
Um, unfortunately, the spotted lanternfly will also happily feed on many other things that we don't want them to feed on. Apple, plum, cherry, peach, pear, apricot, grape, hops, chestnut, oak, maple, birch, willow, and many more. Um, so even though it prefers uh, the tree of heaven, it will also readily eat all those other plants that we don't want them to. And this is, of course, a threat to our nursery industry and our natural areas as well. So the damage that the spotted lanternfly can cause, so they, both the nymphs, so they're the immature stage and the adults are um, sap sucking insects. You can kind of see in that first picture that's looking head, head on at the insect, um, it has a, a mouth part that's kind of like a straw. So it's, it's long mouth part. They use it to pierce plants and suck up all the nice uh, juices of the plant. Um, and if you have a huge infestation of many, you know, thousands of these insects all sucking up the, the juices of the plant, this can severely weaken the plant, disfigure them and even kill them just because all their juices are sucked out of them. Um, this can, can, can create open wounds on the plant, which further attracts more insect herbivores to the weakened, or weakened plant. And because all of this feeding, so they're sucking up all this plant juice, which results in a lot of defecation. <laughs> so they're sucking up all the juice and they're also um, depositing a lot of honeydew. So their excretion is really uh, sweet because they have to filter out a lot of that plant juice and it gets all over the plant. And because it's sugary, this invites mold and fungus to grow, which again is not good for the tree to have all this black mold growing on its, you know, at the bottom of its trunk or bottom of its uh, stem. So yeah, can be very, very damaging. And we, of course, are concerned about this because, well, um, last year we found two dead ones out in Benton County and in Marion County. Um, both were found at uh, two different plant nurse nurseries there. Luckily, both of them were dead, dead adults. Um, it's believed that adults uh, and nymphs can't survive very long without feeding. So even though Pencil Pennsylvania or you know back east is fairly far away um it's not it's not uh, inconceivable that adults and nymphs could be shipped here very very quickly and can can survive that journey so even though these were dead it still doesn't rule out that we could get live uh, insects shipped here and if you're curious they were these dead adults were found on the first one was on a shipment of shrink wrapped ceram ceramic pots on wooden pallets. And the second one was found on various uh, miscellaneous nursery supplies that were on cardboard boxes. So we're not sure if that is important, but just I don't know, interesting factoid. And our plant uh, nursery in inspectors went to both of these sites and inspected the entire shipment for any more adults or nymphs and egg masses. and. Luckily, nothing else was found, um, but this just highlights that we are going to have to really be on top of this and monitor shipments from infested areas. So how can you identify spotted lanternfly? These are also pretty easy to identify because they're very striking in their coloration. Uh, the first in stars, so the, once the, they hatch out of their egg, they're very small nymph they're black with white spots as they grow they continue with that uh, black and white spots but the very last instar before it becomes an adult it's a bright red with black and white spots and then when it becomes an adult it has very distinctive wings um, that are kind of grayish pink yellowish it just kind of depends but they have those polka dots on them and when they fly, you can see that their hind wings are red with more polka dots and a bright yellow and black abdomen. 
So you know, very striking colors. Okay, moving on to rapid fire. Other next one is Houdini fly. Um, so maybe some of you keep um, mason bees in your yard as a, a hobby or for pollination. Um, mason bees are a, a native insect that we have here in Oregon. They, so this picture kind of shows a brief life cycle of the mason bee before I talk about the, the invasive Houdini fly, just so you can get an idea of how the Houdini fly attacks the mason bee. We gotta go over the life cycle of the mason bee first. Um, the female collects pollen for her young. She'll get pollen and nectar. She'll find, if it's in the wild, a, a twig, a hollowed out twig or branch, or in, the, in this case, a mason bee house that someone's put out with little tunnels inside of it. She'll go in there, put all the pollen in, lay an egg, which is that little white thing. It looks like a grain of rice. And they're called mason bees because she'll collect mud and separate those uh, chambers with little mud division. So she's very busy collecting pollen, lays an egg, puts some mud, and does it all over again inside that little tunnel. And in the spring, um, well, throughout the summer that the egg will hatch and eat all that pollen, it'll pupate. And then in the next spring, an adult will, or many adults will emerge out of those little tunnels and start the cycle over again. However, uh, mason bees have many pests they have to worry about. And unfortunately there is a new non-native invasive pest uh, from Europe that's been found here in Washington and in Oregon. It's a kleptoparasite of mason bees called the Houdini fly is the common name of it. So what the fly does is she'll go into that, um, that uh, tunnel where the mason bee has laid all of her eggs and the fly will, fly will go in, lay its eggs and those eggs will hatch and eat all of the pollen that was meant for the mason bee, the, the flies, larva, uh, larva will eat it for themselves. So that third picture shows a tunnel that has been completely overtaken by Houdini fly maggots. Um, instead of having one little nice mason bee in there, there's several, a dozen or so flies that are gonna emerge. And when they do emerge, it's kind of interesting. They use their head to break through those mud walls so they, they pump up their head with a hydraulic fluid and they kind of like expand it and contract it to push through uh, the little mud walls. I couldn't get a video to work here, but if you, you know, type in, in YouTube Houdini fly, you might be able to find the video where you can see them using their head to punch through the wooden, or not wooden, the mud uh, division. So it definitely is in Washington state. It was confirmed in 2017. I don't think it's been officially confirmed by USDA that we have it in Oregon, but um, it is unofficially here, unfortunately. So without um, action or without taking management um, practices, the Houdini fly can quickly overtake an entire, you know, mason bee little house and proliferate and go into the environment and spread more and more. Um, this can be bad for your, you know, your hobby and also for commercial operations that are using mason bees um, on an economic scale and harmful to our native bees because all of these Houdini flies will also attack the native uh, the mason bees we have in more natural settings, which is not good. So if you have a mason bee house, uh, you need to be extra vig vigilant for this uh, pest. Um, the adults are often are fairly small and they're kind of hard to identify, but if you see a small little fly hanging out on your mason bee box, just kind of sitting there, um, it is very likely it could be the Houdini fly. <laughs> they're slow moving because they're just kind of hanging out waiting for the right time to go into that cell and lay, lay her eggs. So if you see little flies hanging out on your 
nesting block, um, you can squish them or capture them in some way so they don't continue to reproduce. If later in the season, when you open up your mason bee um, uh, nesting block to clean the cocoons, if you see cocoons that have these a sticky mass of dozen or more maggots, that's probably Houdini fly. And they're the poop, the frass of the Houdini fly larva are these orange kind of curly Q um, little bits. And so that just gives you more indication that that is Houdini fly. You can squish them or freeze them or put them in alcohol, whichever method you prefer. Okay, last couple ones. These ones are quick. Um, the lily leaf beetle. This is also a very, very new one that we don't have in Oregon yet, but we want to be always on the lookout for it because it might be on the way. Um, it's native to Europe and Asia. It's a severe pest of lilies, as, as the name implies. It's currently found um, north in northeastern North America and British Columbia, and just recently it was found in Washington. So it, it could be here any minute. Um, so we want to know about that if it does get here. The, how you can identify them, the adults are bright, bright red with black heads and black legs and black antenna. And one thing they like to do that's pretty gross is the larva make what's called a poop shield. So those bottom pictures are the larva. Um, those, yeah, the three, three larvae have those poop shields and one is a naked one without a poop shield. So you can kind of see what it looks like, but that's a defensive mechanism. They'll cover themselves in their, in their poop and that discourages other predators from eating them because that's not very appetizing. So if you have lilies um, that look like they're being severely damaged and you find these little smushy brown um, little guys, if you look, if you try to peel off the poop, you might see this larva and then you might have lily flea beetle and you should let us know. Okay, viburnum leaf beetle. This is another leaf beetle native to Europe and Asia. It's in Northeastern US and Canada and most recently in British Columbia. So we're kind of seeing it expand its range. Um, so we also want to be on the lookout for it here in Oregon. So if you have viburnum plants, um, be extra vigilant on those for any new damage that you're not used to seeing. Um, the larva, or not larva, the adults are kind of a bright golden color. They're really pretty. We do have kind of many lookalikes though. Uh, the larva are also yellowish green in color with black, black spots. Um, but the main thing to look out for is the damage caused by both the lily leaf beetle and the viburnum leaf beetle. If you notice that these plants are getting heavily damaged in ways we haven't really seen before, be extra vigilant at that. Um, especially with vi viburnum, the flea beetles will skeletonize that leaf. So they'll eat all the nice soft tissue and leave just the veins. Another good way to keep a lookout on your viburnum is for um, the, these, the, so the adults, they chew, or the females, they chew little holes on the twigs to lay their eggs inside. And then they cover it up with these distinctive little cappings of chewed bark and frass. Um, so if you, in the, in the winter, if you look at your viburnum, stems and twigs and they have this kind of pattern along them that might be indication that you have viburnum leaf beetle. Um, so yeah, that's one way to keep an eye out. Okay, last insect, I believe, the allium leaf miner. This is a pest of garlic, leek, onion, and chive. It's currently established in northeastern U.S. and we're really on the lookout for this one because it would be highly, highly devastating to our onion industry, our garlic and leek industry as well. Um, onion, we're, we have about $125 million onion industry every year. So this is a, would be a huge pest to that industry. Um, we currently, or I don't know if it's gone through yet, but 
we're either working on or has just about gone through our temp or quarantine on this pest to help give us more tools to keep it out of Oregon. The adults are a flea, they're a fly. They're grayish with yellow heads and the larvae are yellow maggots that feed inside the leaf because they're the leaf miner. So they mine their way through the leaf, eating all the tissue. Um, because the adults and larvae are, you know, not super distinctive, again, looking at that damage on your um, allium plant, so onion, garlic, and leek, the adults do a distinctive feeding damage where they kind of chew in a pattern all the way down um, the stem of the plant. The larvae also make those mines. Um, that's what the third picture is showing. The, there's a larva in there eating the tissue and you can kind of follow its path. Um, the, they then pupate um, in the bulbs of, of plants and that's also why they can be easily transported is because they're in the bulb and we move the bulbs around and then we get allium leaf miner. Um, if you have a high infestation, it can cause the plants to wilt and have twisted and curled leaves is another sign of uh, damage from this fly. Okay, the final part of the presentation are just a couple things that you all could uh, you know, be aware of and help do to help aid in our fight <laughs> against all these um, different pests. So I'm not sure if I should take some questions now and then continue on with this, this last part or, uh, you know, I'm running kind of long on time. Well, does anyone have any questions? Oh, we have one. How close to Oregon are emerald ash borers? Is ODA actively watching for this pest? Oh, yeah. I, I thought about including emerald ash borer in this presentation, but maybe next time I will. Um, I don't think it's super close right now. I think it's only back east and in the Midwest. However, um, just recently the, the federal government ended their, um, oh, what was it, their quarantine on it because it's too widespread. So unfortunately, it's probably only a matter of time before it gets to Oregon. We're not sure, it's, it's hard to say how quickly that will happen. Um, I know they're trying to slow the spread still um, there's a big push, you might have heard, um, for firewood, burn it where you buy it. So that's one thing for emerald ash borer and other pests is for firewood. Um, if you buy firewood, try to burn it in the same county that you buy it in. Don't, you know, go, go back east and you're camping, you get firewood and bring it back here to Oregon. That's one sure way to increase the likelihood that emerald ash borer is brought here sooner. Well, I don't see any more right at the moment, Jessica. So why don't you finish up and, and then we'll have a, a final pause for questions at the end. All right. Sorry, so so much to go over. <laughs> so as I mentioned, um, just having so many eyes out there that are familiar with, with your plants and what kind of damage you've already seen. If you see anything out of the ordinary or if you have any questions about it, you should definitely tell someone, take a picture, collect it and report it to either ODA. Um, we also have a specific Asian giant hornet uh, report just for Asian giant hornet because that was so big in the news. But there's us, there's also the Oregon Invasive Species Council. I have their email and phone number up there. Also OSU Extension is another great resource to report things to. Uh, for gypsy moth and spotted lanternfly, please look for egg masses. That's a, a big thing. If you're if traveling back east, you know, with your R RV or your car, and then you come back to Oregon, be sure to look for egg masses. So the female gypsy moth lays eggs on just about anything. Um, they're tan, buff colored, kind of hair covered in little hairs. Um, there's some pictures of them. So just keep an eye out on your stuff, especially if you're going out of Oregon and coming back, just give it a look over. 
Same thing with a spotted lanternfly. The females lay eggs. They cover those eggs in a waxy color or waxy secretion that as it ages kind of looks like caked on mud. So at the bottom there are some pictures of what looks kind of like mud on that um, camping chair and back of a wood pallet, but it's not mud. It's a spotted, spotted lanternfly egg mass. So be if that was yours, be sure to take all of that off of it before you come back into Oregon. For Japanese beetle, one main thing, um, moving plants, unfortunately, is one of the main ways that Japanese beetle gets into Oregon. Um, people that live back east, you know, have their plants. They're, they put lots of time and money and love into their plants. And so when they move here to Oregon, they bring them with them. But those can have many different pests in them, unfortunately. The current infestation we're battling in um, the Cedar Mill Bethany area for Japanese beetle, we, we suspect that's how it got here is someone brought plants with them and they had larvae in the soil. So be very careful when you're moving with your plants. Um, maybe take that opportunity to buy a whole bunch of new plants or grow many new plants that you always wanted to. And on ODA's website, we do have pest alerts and you can always call us or other or the extension agency to ask about your particular county. If I'm moving from this county to this county, is there anything I need to be on the lookout for or be wary of? Uh, the Japanese beetle, we have its own dedicated website about the eradication efforts. Um, so it's japanesebeetlepdx.info. Um, so if you're in the treatment area, um, definitely check it out. Feel free to ask me questions now or later about that. Um, and one thing, unfortunately, if, they're, if you're in the uh, quarantined area where you cannot have plant sales that move plants outside of that um, roughly, uh, again, about 3,000 acres or so, because it could be infested with Japanese beetle and we don't want it moved outside of that area. Houdini fly, I just kind of very briefly mentioned, if you have a Mason Bee hotel or, or house, you really need to be cleaning those cocoons at the end of the year to make sure that they're healthy and to kill any Houdini flies or other parasites that might be in there. So you can have healthy, happy uh, Mason Bees and none of the uh, invasive pests. There's many resources online. I think this one, I included a Lynn County Master Gardeners. They have a great YouTube of cleaning uh, mason bee cocoons. I think maybe Benton County too, but yeah, it's just this one for that I included. Um, bee in Bloom is another great um, resource. It has another uh, video about how to clean the cocoons in great detail. And yeah, I think I already mentioned for the, the leaf beetles, keep an eye out on your plants, the lily and viburnum. If you notice any of this weird damage going on or these uh, symptoms, uh, let us know. Same for allium, keep an eye on those plants. And if you see this kind of damage, let us know. All right, well, uh, thank you all for sticking with me. I know it was a lot of information to throw at everybody, but yeah, hopefully it was somewhat informative and yeah. Thank you, Jessica. Anyone have any questions? I will remind everyone that uh, in a short time, this video will be posted on our website uh, or linked from our website, bentonmg.org. Uh, and there is a link right on the homepage for that through the YouTube channel, which has, will have this presentation and which has our recent past presentations. So if there's anything you want to review, any specific information you want to get, if you want to share this with uh, friends or colleagues, you're welcome to do that. And uh, I know that uh, Jessica will be one of the featured speakers at Mini College in July, uh, where she'll be adding a few more pests to her presentation then. Yeah. <laughs> I'll keep Asian giant hornet for sure though. <laughs> <laughs> it's the big scary looking one. Yeah.
Well, I'm not seeing any new questions, but I'm just seeing thank yous and uh, uh, for the presentation. Uh, I think the audience enjoyed that. It's been a lot to uh, take on, uh, but as Master Gardeners, these are all things that uh, we need to be aware of and things that we can do to help out the public when we see something strange that comes into the office. I hope coming into the office sometime soon. Mm -hmm. So Jessica, thank you again. Very glad you could join us tonight and good luck with your future presentations. Yeah, thank you. And thank you all for, yeah, wanting to be informed and all those eyes on the ground are invaluable. Thanks, Jessica. Thank you. Many more.